Welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop. I'm Christine, and I'm here with John and Carl, our guest. Hey, guys. Hey there. Hello. All right. And this time, it is John's turn to pick a story. So, John, what did you pick? I picked a story by John Updike called A&P. In walks these three girls in nothing but bathing suits. I'm in the third checkout slot with my back to the door, so I don't see them until they're over by the bread. The one that caught my eye first was the one in the plaid green two-piece. She was a chunky kid with a good tan and a sweet, broad, soft-looking can with those two crescents of white just under it, where the sun never seems to hit at the top of the backs of her legs. I stood there with my hand on a box of hi-ho crackers trying to remember if I rang it up or not. I ring it up again and the customer starts giving me hell. She's one of these cash register watchers, a witch about 50 with rouge on her cheekbones and no eyebrows, and I know it made her day to trip me up. She'd been watching cash registers for 50 years and probably never seen a mistake before. Very good. So why did you pick this story, John? I've had it in, in my list of stories I wanted to bring ever since the very first time we tried to record with our original co-host and uh, his audio got messed up. <laughs> but he mentioned loving the story. He mentioned that this story had a huge impact on his life and I always wanted to find an excuse to bring it in. So I just thought I'd bring it in for this one. Wow. I cannot wait to harass Greg about why this story had an impact on his life because it is all <laughs> about teenage girls at a gas station and quitting your job. Greg, what did you do? But beyond that, this is just a, a classic story. It does a lot of different things and I thought it would be a good one to talk about. When was the story written? Do you know 60s? 61 is when it was first came out. He was like an editor at the New Yorker, so he probably just sent it to the printing department. Didn't have to yeah. worry about it. <laughs> they were all like that. Him and Eva and Salinger and all these guys. That it reminds me of them. I, I, I love the, 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 I was going to say, I love the language that pops up in these circus 1960s, late 50s stories. The can. I love the word can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when have you ever heard? <laughs> you certainly noticed the bathing suits. I can tell you that. that yeah. It felt like a really authentic story, too. Part of me doubts that he would come up with this scenario. It's more just kind of like, we all know what it's like when you're working your lame job as a teenager and something interesting happens. That's right. And the threshold for something interesting is so low. But if you're a teenage boy, like this is high drama. And so I love how it unfolds that way. It unfolds like high drama. And he's watching them go up and down the aisles. And there's something really fun about that. And even like the adults are like noticing, but he's the one like taking a certain kind of pleasure in it and he feels hopeful you know even as he's like describing these girls and it's not like they're unflattering terms but i think he calls the one like a ditz or something he even starts off by calling this one chunky but like he's just the female form is blowing his mind right now that's right he can't even ring up crackers and there's something about it that felt really authentic and really um i don't know like a norman rockwell painting <laughs> like three girls in an aisle and a guy just like mouth open but yeah, so I, I got that feeling. I got that like era. Uh, well, the very fact, I mean, he's he's fascinated by tan lines. I can tell you that too. <laughs> a lot of tan lines language going on here. One, one of the things that's interesting about this is that the premise that three teenage girls in bathing suits, probably demure bathing suits too, you know, given the, the era, would, would cause a scene in a um, supermarket or a store is quaint by today's standards. You know, you see this happening all the time, especially Naples. I mean, people in bathing suits are just not <laughs> yeah. out of the ordinary. Mm -hmm. And some people, I should should say some people ought not to be in their bathing suits and <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there's some people that should just cover up for <laughs> for everyone's sake reasons yeah but i like this i like to me this the tone and the voice and the language was he i think updike is such a good writer and i think he what was compelling about this is that he nailed this teenager's feelings and and his fascination with these girls really nailed it on the head and the boring part about his job and his sort of his unplanned venture into this uh, into the chivalry that he showed <laughs> or he thinks he showed at the end kind of it just kind of happened like it like it would happen with a teenager you know it was like he pitched a fit you know he just had a, a moment and he and he just kept going with it and he knew this was probably not going to work out well in the end for him yeah it was, it was really impulsive but you could see how in the moment too it felt really heroic like he felt this moment building for himself he's like i'm gonna do something yeah, and then, he, and then he didn't stop. I love the way it plays out because he says, uh, I say, I quit to Langle enough for them to hear, hoping they'll stop and watch me, their unsuspected hero. They keep right on going. 
And then he has to follow through with it after that. He sees it, they're still going and they're like, what did you, did you say something, Sammy? I said, I quit. And he's <laughs> committed now. <laughs> and they didn't even notice and they'll never know. Yeah. Which is why he had to write this. <laughs> it's like, are you out there somewhere? <laughs> yeah, this is like the, before Craigslist misconnections, he was like, I'm going to publish this in the New Yorker and just play it off as fiction if no one ever calls. <laughs> <laughs> but like the ending there, I wondered how what you guys thought of this ending. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read the last paragraph. I look around for my girls, but they're gone, of course. There wasn't anybody but some young married screaming with their children about some candy they didn't get by the door of a powder blue Falcon station wagon. Looking back in the big windows over the bags of peat moss and aluminum lawn furniture stacked on the pavement, I could see Langle in my place in the slot, checking the sheep through. His face was dark gray and his back stiff, as if he'd just had an injection of iron. And my stomach kind of fell as I felt how hard the world was going to be to me hereafter. As I'm reading that now, I'm having a little bit of an epiphany, but the first time I read it, I was like, wow, that's a really dramatic ending. But I wonder if he's just like kind of reflecting on the fact that he quit his easiest job. He quit his first job and the jobs after your first job suck. Like my first job was Subway and I thought it was terrible. And now I often daydream about mindless manual labor (laughs) and making sandwiches. And like, I wonder if that's kind of what the takeaway was, because I would have loved this story just as much had it ended with him kind of fading down the side walk with these girls like tagging along like even if he had to run and catch up to him and they didn't hear him quitting but I, I don't know I wondered what you guys thought about the ending my takeaway was uh, and that about that last line was that he uh, he realized now that he's done kind of an adult thing or what he views let's say as an adult thing he quit his job which is a pretty dramatic thing to do for anybody at any age really but when you quit your job all of a sudden he's launched he's a he's a 19 year old kid and now he's launched into the world of adults and he feels like uh, I don't know I I, and my sense was that he feels the pain of being an adult all of a sudden. Right. He's an adult and maybe like you said, like quitting your job is really dramatic. Now it's like the world's going to be hard to you because now you have to find the next thing or hope you find the next thing. Well, the, the manager that he quits too, when he tells him I quit, is a family friend who knows his parents, you know? So it feels like obviously his parents must have done something or suggested he get this job. It had something to do with him having this job, right? Because he the manager says, what will your parents think of this if you quit? And it's, it's it's a moment where he he's making a decision that doesn't come from them. So that's a very much a uh, an adult thing, like you said. Yeah, it's like he was handed this job and now he's turning it away and he has to answer for that now. Everything from this moment forward is going to be on my own. He's so independent. <laughs> I remember as a callow youth getting having one of my early jobs was at the Hartford Current, the newspaper. And um, my father worked there at the Hartford Current and he got me the job. And it was in the mail room of the newspaper. And, and the mail room of the newspaper newspaper is, as you know, is, is a place where they put the sections together of the newspaper before they get shipped out on, onto the truck. So it's like a big, it's a very, it's a machine that does it and you load the section, section, the front page and sports and whatever, and it drops in and blah, blah, blah. So automated thing with a bunch of people working on this big head, they call it. It was the most excruciatingly soul sucking job that I've ever ever had before or since. And my dad got me the job. I was like 17 or 16 or whatever. And I felt like I was in this situation where I was going to go insane, but I couldn't quit because it was my dad and his reputation was on the line. So what do you do in a situation? Though That was what I was wrestling with at that moment. And um, it's a pretty heavy moment for a teenager, actually, you know, disappointing your parents who stuck their neck out for you. I'm not sure I would have considered it in the same way. I I, I didn't I didn't actually quit the job. I, I let it peter out naturally. Surely it was a summer job. So, but uh, how that would have, you know, had I done something rash and impulsive like this and just quit for different reasons, of course, but just quit, then I don't know how it would have played out in the long run. And now that I think about it, it was, it's, it's a pretty heavy duty thing to do to quit a job like that with your parents' reputations. Especially if, if you have to tell them why you quit. And especially if, even if you lie about why you quit, your boss watched it all happen. Right. <laughs> Like some babes came in and your son just left. <laughs> Ran out the door. He was mesmerized and he walked out after them. But he does say fiddly do. 
Yeah, that was funny. Which I thought was kind of telling. Did you get the impression, though, that this whole thing, even though it's, I, I you can't escape this with Updike or with Cheever or with all those guys who were, you know, those New Yorker writers of the 1960s and 50s, how urbane, even though it was the teenager speaking, the narrator, again, in the first person is a teenager, it felt more urbane than in the way the New Yorker writers at that time could only be. And he kind of, Updike sets the tone for that kind of thing, actually. I felt like, like, injecting that fiddly do thing about and then saying that was a phrase of my grandmother's and I know she would have been pleased. That is it's like, it's a kind of a typical way of sloughing off the drama of it all before it becomes very dramatic. It was like a weird random phrase, you know, and it was kind of cutesy in that moment, this dramatic moment, but it felt in line with like all of the kind of humor that this piece already had. Like I imagine he's, I don't know, there's something about like the narrator that I don't know. I don't know if he, if we're supposed to think that he's writing it as it happened or thinking it as it happened or he wrote it right after. To me, it feels like he wrote it about a young boy, you know, and something like fiddle dee doo, like is, I don't know. I feel like it's an adult recognition that that was a bizarre timing and a a, a moment of levity in the most dramatic part of the story. There's this thing that happens in these, I encountered it because actually my novel, the novel that, the one that got published was... uh, Oh yeah, look at that, the casual. (laughs) uh, Which one was it? Oh... Link in the show notes. <laughs> the publisher. As opposed to all the ones I've written that didn't get published. It's, right, right. I don't know if that's a kind of a humble brag or what, but, you know, seven down, one up, I guess, was probably <laughs> not much to brag about. Anyway, it, it, it's a coming of age kind of situation. There are teenager, young kids involved. And um, so the question is, when you're writing something like this and you're, you're um, in Caulfield, for that matter, you know, in Catcher in the Rye, I mean, it's in scene, he's writing, this kid is, is writing, it's just so the, the question is, do you have your 13 or 14 or whatever age, 8, 19 year old kid talking in these kind of sophisticated ways, you know, these, these, these adult ways, even though someone like Caulfield, you know, railed against this phony sophistication of, of the age and all that, he was in his own way sophisticated. So it's an adult voice coming through a young person. And the criticism some people had for my one novel that got published was that it was that 14 year olds don't sound like that. Mm. And I said, but they do, they can. And in my mind, they do. Mm-hmm. I always hated that feedback. That's such dumb feedback. It doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, especially what do they want you to do? Write in a paragraph to say that this guy is really 32 years old, reflecting on something that happened 18 years before that. I don't want to go that far. That seems phony in, in and of itself and fake. And, and it doesn't work. So if you're in scene, stay in scene. Let the kid have the. Young people with sophisticated voices have been in literature forever. Even in his own way, Tom Sawyer was had kind of a sophisticated voice. And so did Huckleberry Finn, even though it was laden with the, you know, accents and all that. But it had a sophistication. Anyway, that's my little sidebar for today. No, I think that's good. And I also, I also think like the younger you get, the more valid that criticism is. My three-year-old's not going to sound like a... <laughs> yeah, it's a delicate balance. Well, the precociousness though is... Precociousness is precociousness. It exists, right. Yeah. One thing about this voice, when I was an undergraduate, I wrote a paper in one of my writing classes, like a creative writing, a workshop. We just wrote a paper about a story. I forget what the prompt was, but I chose to deride Updike's use of tense in this piece, which um, I should now apologize for because at the time I didn't know what I was talking about. But <laughs> I mean, I knew I didn't, I didn't appreciate the present tense. And he starts it off in walks these three girls in nothing but bathing suits. I'm in the third checkout slot. This is present tense, but it's not really present tense. Right. This story is not really told in the present tense. This is just a, a way of speaking. This is the way people tell stories a lot of times as they shift back and forth between past and present when they're speaking. And he does this so well in this story where it's like sometimes it's in the present tense, sometimes in the past tense, depending on what he's talking about and where his point of view is in that moment. It's really interesting. And uh, if anyone's listening and wants to spend some time thinking about tense, this is a good story to do it with. You know, I didn't even notice that. I didn't even see it. So he did it. It must have done it well. But you're right. Yeah. I mean, obviously at the time I'm in this creative writing workshop and I'm thinking about tense a lot. So when I read this, I was 
thinking, oh, this isn't done correctly because, or quote unquote correctly, because he's changing from past to present, but I didn't get what he was doing at the time. One of the great things about this piece too, for me was that I appreciate the range of this writer, Updike, who we all know is, you know, an enormous presence in American writing or was, and everything from his, some of his critic critiques and, you know, some of the things he used to write for the New Yorker that weren't fiction, his critiques and whatever were almost impenetrable for me. I, they just were so laden with, this story was not, it was kind of fresh in that sense for me. The language was accessible. The story made sense. It, it was accessible and, uh, and fun actually in its own way. It was, yeah. it was a fun story. Yeah. When was the last time we read a fun story? Yeah. Yeah. When was the last time someone called one of your stories fun? I don't think anyone's ever called one of my stories fun. No. Yeah. I think a lot of writers have this feeling that they, maybe maybe people who are just starting out writing, uh, they feel like they have to be heavy and dramatic and, you know, it's got to be, it has to be laden with meaning and, and analogies and metaphors and blah, 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 and all that stuff. When in fact, you should just be having fun when you're writing. If you do, it comes through. Yeah. Yeah. Because the reading should be fun, which is often yes. a takeaway that we have. Yeah. Right. What else do you guys like about this uh, yeah i don't know i don't really have anything else specific i just there's a lot of good lines in here yeah i thought it was an interesting turn in the middle when he says now here comes the sad part of the story at least my family says it's sad but i don't think it's so sad myself and that's when he starts talking about them coming up to the register and then he quits by the end <laughs> it's an interesting way to you know kind of address the reader it works with the voice like the style of telling we were talking about right to build on what we were just talking about with the tense thing is this is the a voice of a storyteller that's kind of yes. it's just a guy telling a story in the living room or something right which you know harkens back to what stories were 10,000 years ago you know just around a fire you know, tell you about the elk I was hunting or something yeah that's how that that first sentence is that you read it's okay so in walks these three girls yeah exactly and then when he says this is the part where my family's like that's your side that's where you like take on a different tone in your own story and you're like this is the part my my parents don't like yeah but I love that I love the way he, he assigns nicknames to these girls too because starts calling her Queenie he kind of picks apart the social structure of these three pretty quickly or at least what he thinks is true and then he gives them names and boom they're off yeah he says Queenie and plaid and big tall goonie goonie <laughs> 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 we we've talked about that in in past stories and i'm thinking of um celeste ing's story about girls at play yeah and uh it's a group of girls and the perspective is these group of girls always refer to themselves as we which is an interesting thing and how those characters were kind of indistinguishable and that was intentional that had to do with like the theme of the story but in other stories and especially in the workshop we've talked about and in john's john's pieces where it's like you have a, a cast of characters and maybe there's like a battle scene and when you're reading it you have to as the reader be able to distinguish these people and like one of the quickest ways to do it is with nicknames and you remember the nicknames and you immediately draw them in your head whether or not it's accurate it's like the most effective thing that i think you can do and especially if you can tie that nickname to a physical appearance oh and it came up too john in the other story that you picked with am this computer tortures like five people and you have to tell the five people apart and they give like one a deformity <laughs> you know and it's like okay that works i got him i got him figured out and there's one girl and yeah in in this he's like queenie and plaid and big tall goonie goonie <laughs> that works i got That's it right it's almost like mafia nicknames you know the mafia is like big joe or yeah <laughs> give me two times you know yeah i love those things it creates a connection with the reader too somehow oh yeah it feels um like you know them like that's your nickname for them that's what nicknames do my takeaway from this is what I said at the beginning, which is that like, this is high drama and it's one scene. And I've written stories like this in my subway setting, believe it or not. That was like all I could write about for the longest time. I was like, I thought subway was the funniest place to work. I thought everything that happened was like sitcom worthy. And I've written pieces where it was like this, not this well done, but where it was just one scene and the dramatic buildup lasted 1500 words. And I feel like so often people when they are faced with short stories think that the challenge is not to fill 1500 words or to write something like that feels like a novel feels like complete and dramatic but the challenge 
that they mistakenly take is that how, how much ground can I cover with these words? And it's like, you don't have to cover any ground. You can stay at the gas station and tell a story that I remember when three girls walk in. So I love when a story is literally just this one thing and you know it from the very beginning. Right. So what are your takeaways? My takeaway is similar to that in that this story, you know, if you read kind of the introduction to this that I have in this anthology talks about how it like establishes the feeling of the Cold War in some way, which, you know, you can make an argument for whether it does that. But this story is just one thing, like you said, and it has the potential to reach for all this other stuff, all this cultural stuff, reflection on growing up, so many different themes that can be built out of it. And I think that, you know, as a writer, all you have to do is find those just simple, concrete, everyday things like events, activities, actions, and the story can just focus on those and you bring it to life and it can have the potential to reach for the stars from there. And you can do all everything that you can do with a story story with just a simple thing. It seems like even though those things are things that he could have reached for and decided not to, that they're playing a role in this feel of the story, right? They're there. They're they're off the page, but they're informing everything about it. And a really astute critic and reader can do what you just mentioned and say, this has Cold War feels. And me over here, I'm like, does it? I don't know. I still liked it. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a mood, right? There's a mood in there. Yes. What about you, Carl? My takeaway is, is a similar thing in the in the sense that the simplicity. I think that you know, except for genre kind of fiction, uh, if, you know, when, if you want to get into fantasy or, or or science fiction, which are great, which are terrific in, in their own way, but this kind of a story, which takes an ordinary situation from ordinary people with ordinary, you know, everything that people can relate to, or that's happening from the beginning to the end. Why it's compelling for people is that they've all been there, they've seen stuff like this, or they felt things like this. And that's what makes it a good short story, I think, or outside of the genre fiction, compelling to people. They can put themselves in the, into that situation and they can say, yeah, I feel like I've been there. I wished I had done it like that or I, or however it works out. Or I just simply, I can see that happen. I can see that. And that's what that's a very compelling thing for people. Yeah, that can't be overstated. Writing about something that other people recognize. Right, exactly. Something that you identify with. Yeah, like you said, just the feeling maybe alone, but also like what's actually happening in the scene. Right. Like you as a teenage boy are distracted by teenage girls. I think sometimes when a writer does a good piece of writing and they bring it in like to our workshop, it's not until the feedback that they realize that that's what they've done because people start saying things like, this reminds me of right. when I was. And it's like, that's why they like it. Okay. They're not talking about the writing right now. <laughs> They're talking about your content and there's something there. Like you've nailed a feeling in a, in a scene in a place. And yeah, that's a really good point. Wow. That's a really good point, Carl. That's a really really good point. You might be able to record another episode with us, Carl, with that kind of point. I mean, you were a guest, but you might have been elevated. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, guys. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, consider subscribing to our monthly newsletter at our website, NaplesWritersWorkshop.com. And for daily writing tips, industry news, and great short fiction, join our Facebook group at Facebook.com slash groups slash Naples Writers Workshop.